Guys, can we stand to our feet tonight? Thank you all. We're going to get things going. How many of y'all come to worship the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. Let's just join tonight. Before we just do anything, let's just, can we just lift our hands up tonight and just take our minds off of whatever is crazy and just put it on God tonight? Just lift your hands, everybody in this room. If you're able, if you're physically able, just begin to just worship the King tonight. Let's just set this place, an atmosphere of worship. Release your kingdom, oh Father. Release your King. Come on, join in unity tonight and just worship together. We're family. We're family. Oh, Jesus. of our praise. I'll 
Sing it again. We welcome you. We welcome. We welcome. Be welcome in this place. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King. Who conquers the grave? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Come on, sing it tonight. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, you're worthy. You're worthy. Sing it again. Oh, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy.
You will be praised. You will be praised. 
our praise oh, ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise oh, ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your faithful God your faithful God I trust you cause you're faithful God never ending promises your faithful God
one voice, one church to bring glory. challenge you to engage yourself right now. Put your hand on your heart, lift your hands, whatever you got to do to say, God, in you is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And you live in me. What I'm saying is real. What I'm singing is real. What I'm believing will happen because you are good. You are God. Turn off all the other thoughts. Turn it off. Engage with him right now. God, you are in me. God, you love me. Sometimes just saying that He is God can change us immediately into a place of worship. Look to Him. For yours is the kingdom. Yours, you're in me. You never leave me. You never leave me. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Glory forever, forever, for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever, amen. Release a new sound in this place tonight. Release a new sound in this place tonight. Just in everybody across this room just lift your hands to the Lord this is what Sunday nights are for they're for pushing in and that's what we're gonna do we're gonna push in here we're gonna push in a little bit when we say sing your own song to the Lord what we're saying is tell him with your own words and your own mouth how you feel about him maybe for some of you it's singing in tongues maybe for some of you it's just telling him how thankful you are from everything that he saved you from or maybe you're thankful because his, of his steadfast love. Yeah. Whatever your reason is, when we say sing your own song, uh, it's easy to just disengage, but we're saying, look, share your testimony to God with your mouth. Tell him thank you for saving me from drug addiction. Thank you for saving me from porn addiction. Thank you for saving me from all these issues. Thank you for saving my marriage. Thank you for saving my children. Just begin to, when we say sing your own song, just begin to say it with your mouth to him right now, all across this room. Tell your story to God right now, all across this room, every one of you. Don't feel foolish, disengage from the people around you and start burning some incense at the altar of God. Thank you, Jesus. 
Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for finding us in our own filth and, and pulling us out of it, God. Thank you, Jesus, for being committed to us, for saving our marriages, for saving our families. Maybe some of you tonight are on the verge of divorce and you need to know that God is dedicated to healing your marriage. There is no offense too great in your marriage that God can't heal it. There is no offense in your family too great that God cannot reach down and touch it. We thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. You alone are worthy of our praise because of your great deeds. Tell him that. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy are you, Jesus, to receive our praise. Our problems shrink back at your coming, oh God. Our stress, our anxiety, our fear, our inadequacy shrink back when you get near us. We need your presence, oh God. Like Moses, we cannot leave the mountain of our issues unless you go with us. You alone are worthy, Jesus. You alone are worthy, Jesus. Lift your hands to the Lord. Let's give him the honor he's due. Come on, let's not disengage. Let's push through this. Go past your comfort zone. Go past your comfort zone. your help, Jesus. We can do nothing without Jesus. Jesus, we can't save our marriages. We can't save our families. We can't save our finances. We cannot save our situations without you. And we need your help. So we come with a heart surrendered tonight. We surrender all of our control issues. We surrender all the ways that we control through fear. And we just relinquish that to you, Jesus. And we say, we can trust you, Holy Spirit. We just declare that you are trustworthy. That you will fulfill every promise that you've made to us. That you are the promise keeper. God, even when we fail and we don't get to fulfill our part, you will meet us where we are. God, where we take one step, you leap miles ahead to meet us. God, may we find the bravery to surrender our fear at your altar. May we find the bravery to surrender what we don't know the answer to at your altar. Because, God, you do know the answer. Lord, I pray right now for everyone in this room that they would receive a seed tonight. That tonight we would not just be doing a church service, God, but that we would not just be batting at the wind, but that, Father, tonight would be something eternal that is planted into our hearts and into our minds. Let us push through the fog of what we know and lock eyes with you, Jesus. May we lock eyes with you and find our hope again. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're just going to move into a little time here of just prophecy. I just, I feel some words on me. And so um, I kind of wrote some stuff down um, that I just feel the Holy Spirit saying. 
Um, and we just want to honor that time. You know, we can make all the plans we want, but the Holy Spirit is the one in charge. That's who we submit to and surrender to. And so we're just going to uh, move into a time of prophecy. I don't want you to disconnect. I want you to keep a heart of worship. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Chester. Where's Chester at? He went with the kids. He's already gone. We'll save it for later for Chester. David, I want you to come stand here. I want to pray for you. Just right here, right there. I want everybody to stretch your hands out to David. Here, face me, David. Face me. You know, David, I, I saw the Lord standing in front of you. I saw Jesus in front of you during worship. And um, he called you Peter. And um, I was like, what does that mean, Lord? And I, I saw when, um, you know, Peter had denied Christ, right? And then fast forward a few days later, and Jesus is cooking him breakfast. And he's saying, he said to Peter, he goes, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I love you. And I just saw the Lord asking you that. He's saying, look, do you love me? And you're saying, yes, I love you. And he's asking you again, do you love me? Do you love me? And I feel like the Lord is saying, I'm restoring you to the original intent that I have for your life. And I, I just feel so strongly that the Lord says, you're a man that's uncommon in this way. Um, before the enemy could use the reality of who you were in the sense of like your realness, your rawness, right? But the Lord's saying, I created you to be real, to be raw, and to look through all of the red tape of church and religion and to find truth. And I know you don't say much, uh, but I know that the Lord has filled your heart with mysteries, with questions, with curiosity about who he is. And the Lord was saying, if he could see the man staring back at him in the mirror that I see, it would totally transform the way that he lives. And I don't mean that you're living in sin. I mean that it would bring a spirit of boldness on you. And I saw you as a treasure chest. And the Lord says, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even know that he's a treasure. He doesn't even know that he's a gift to me. And I want to pray that over you because I believe that when you, your heart truly connects to the fact that you are called, that you are a gift to people just as you are, that you have a calling on your life and you are not disqualified in any way, shape, or form from doing great things. Matter of fact, you're more qualified because you're in touch with your reality. And so keep your hands extended. We're just going to pray. Lord, I just thank you for David. Father, I thank you for who you've called him to be. God, I thank you that you said, baby boy, I'm breaking you out of this little box. <clears throat> this is interesting. I saw you as a little boy, and I saw you um, standing uh, like in a closet, like you had been forced into this closet to hide. And I, I heard like the uh, thumping footsteps of an angry father. And um, I just felt like the Lord said, that's not me. That's not how I am. I'm not brooding, uh, looking to be critical of you. He said, I'm looking for you to wrap my arms around you. Um, and so, Lord, I just thank you, Father, that you're showing him that you are a good dad, that you are a good father. Lord, I thank you that you've called him to be a father. The Lord says this, I trust your motives, David. He said, I trust your motives. And I just feel like you are very critical on yourself. And the Lord's saying, stop being so hard on yourself. He said, you're so critical of yourself. And he goes, and if you keep being critical, you're never going to rise up. You're never going to stand up for long because you'll blame yourself. So, Lord, we just thank you, God, that even now, Holy Spirit, you are removing from David a critical spirit, God, that he would embrace the awesome man of God that you have called him to be, Father. Lord, I thank you, God, uh, that he's a rascal for you. Father God, I just saw him like... <laughs> squirming and not being satisfied with anything, Lord, and I thank you that you've allowed him to be that way, Father. Lord, that he's never satisfied with anything, God, and Lord, we just thank you, Father, that um, what the enemy meant to break his spirit concerning perfection, God, you are going to use it to get the job done. And so, Lord, I thank you that he is the head of his house, Father, that he will be the godly man that you've called him to be, that it's not an if I could just be that man, it is an I am that man. Father, I thank you for boldness, for transition, for next level anointing on David's life, on his family, for blessing and favor, Father God, for financial favor and prosperity in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless them. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So we get to push in. As a community, right? Don't we get, you all got to participate in that. You raised your hand. You prayed for somebody. That shoots right down your bloodline into you. The Lord honors you for doing that, just for participating in it. <laughs> Justin, would you come down here?
Everybody extend your hands to Justin. Here, just face me. Face me. As soon as you walked in, I just felt the Lord speak to me. And, you know, when we were hanging out yesterday, just the Lord moving on my heart for you. And um, I just want to pray for you. Um, the Lord said this, he'll do anything for love. He'll do anything to be loved and to know that love, to know love. And um, I just felt like the Lord was saying something so simple. Two things. One is he said, I've given you wisdom beyond your years, beyond your understanding, the gift of wisdom. The Bible talks about the literal gift of wisdom. And I feel like the Lord's given that to you. And uh, you found love. And the Lord says, because you have found love that's not works-based, but is relationship-based, he said, that qualifies you to be a father. And the Lord said, I've called you to be a dad. I've called you to be a father. I saw you, the same kind of thing, chasing a father, you know, and chasing that love. And just the Lord says, now I'm baptizing you to become the father. Now you get to be a father. And you get to bring hope to people that have no hope. I see, I see you literally like a mobile orphanage. And just taking them in and taking them in. And because your heart is so big. In the past, you've seen a lot of garbage in the church. And it's caused you to want to be like, no, 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 I'm not in that world. And, um, but the Lord has grown your love so much that the Lord says, I'm going to use you to help change church culture. And so um, I want to pray for you for that because th you've been mishandled and you were dropped as a child relationally. And the Lord says, but I picked you up and I found you. Ezekiel 16, it says, I found you kicking about in your own blood when you were thrown away and nobody cared enough to rub you with salt, but I found you kicking about in your own blood and I said, live. And that's what God did for you. He found you and he said, live. And um, I just want to pray for you because there's such an anointing on your life. You're already an incredible man. The Lord says this, you don't ever have to sweeten the deal. You're enough for people just as you are. I saw you like a little boy trying to pull on the dad's leg and get his attention. And the Lord's like, you don't even have to do that with me. I see you. You don't even have to get my attention. I see you. And so I just want to pray that over you. Is that okay? All right. Lord, I thank you for Justin. Father, I thank you for my friend. Lord, I thank you that you're calling him into new levels of fatherhood. God, that you said you trust him to be a father to many, God. Lord, and I just thank you, Holy Spirit, for the gift of wisdom that rests upon him. Father God, I, I thank you for the natural godly wisdom that, you, that he's a seeker, Father. He seeks wisdom. He seeks knowledge on situations, Father, where most people in his generation don't look back, Lord. He looks back and wants to understand. That's really interesting. I saw your history and just the Lord saying, I'm pressing delete on everything. On everything. He said, I, and, and we're just starting from here forward. He said, everything you've ever known, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally rock your world. Rock your understanding of what you know about me. But Lord, I just thank you that you've anointed Justin, that you've called him, Father God, that you've set him aside, God, as a mobile orphanage to love those who've been thrown away. God, to love those who have been marginalized, who have experienced the injustice of not having a father in their lives. Lord, and that you're going to use him because of his heart to do great things. Lord, I pray you would bless him. Give him his heart's desire, Father God. And I don't know, I just heard the Lord speak this, and so, <laughs> but the Lord said, stop taking yourself so seriously. So, Lord, I just pray he'd be able to chill and not take himself so seriously. <laughs> Lord, um, I just thank you for his heart, God, his friendship, and who he is as a brother in the Lord. I pray, Father, that you would bless him. In your name we pray. Amen. Chester, you would stand right there, please. Something real simple uh, during worship that the Lord kind of spoke to me. Um, I felt like a, there was a shift in coming in your finances. For, and, and so the Lord was saying, I'm bringing the breakthrough of that. And he goes, um, it's literally going to be, um, it's literally going to be secular funding. It's not coming from the church. The Lord says, you may get some from the church, but I, I really see the government. And when I say government, I mean the city taking notice and saying, uh, we would love to have that in our city. And so the Lord opening up grants, opening up all those kind of things to help your ministry. But, so I want to pray for that for you, okay? Extend your hands. Well, let's agree in financial breakthrough for Kingdom Zoo for Chester, for his whole family. Um, Lord, I thank you for the reward of humility. Lord, I thank you that he's loved rightly. That every time you asked him, Father, to bow low, he did it. Lord, every time you've said, um, could you get that for me, son, he got it. Lord, and I just thank you that he does it because he's a son, not because he's a worker. God, but because he's a son. 
Lord, and I just thank you that even now, Father, we just decree in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we speak to the heavens and we say, open up finances in the heavens. Pour out great finances over this, Lord. I pray even for a magnetism, a supernatural magnetism on Kingdom Zoo. Father God, that there would be political figures, there would be governmental figures that it would catch their attention, Father. And they would say, what a great idea. Father, I just pray, God, for the next level, the shift, God. I speak even, God, prophetically from the office that I serve from. And I speak shift in the name of Jesus over Chester, over his family, and over his zoo. In the name of Jesus, shift. Come into alignment with the destiny of God. No more lack. No more worry. No more patching up holes. Lord, we just pray for the finances to reign in, Father God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That's a picture I saw, Chester. Was I saw you just like patching things, you know, like things were broke and you were like, I got to duct tape it to, you know, you have been doing that. Well, uh, yeah, you literally been duct taping things. And I just felt like we were saying, no, no, we're moving out of the junkyard and into the house. And so, amen. All right. Amen. Joshua, you and your awesome wife, would you come down here? stand right there facing me. I, I saw a very interesting thing over both of you. And um, the Lord took me to um, Luke 10, verse 30. And um, it's a story of the Good Samaritan. And, um, you know, Jesus is being ridiculed by a religious figure in this text, um, which you are no strangers to. Um, <laughs> but the Lord says this a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead now by chance a priest and it goes through I'm going to just paraphrase it goes through the whole story and the last person says but a Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was and when he saw him he had compassion he went to him and bound up his wounds pouring on oil and wine. And I felt like what the Lord was saying through this. And then, you know, the Samaritan takes him to an inn and pays for him to stay and get well. I felt like what the Lord was saying is that the church had been the man that was robbed and beaten. And on the side of the road, all the religious figures passed by and wouldn't help her, wouldn't help him. But you were the good Samaritan that decided to stop and help him and take care of him. And the Lord's asking you tonight, he's saying, Will you be the good Samaritan? Will you continue to find her cast on the side of the road, beaten, depraved, and abused, and help her? And I really feel this very strongly during worship that the Lord is saying, you are both mandated to help the church. You have something in you that the church needs. It needs it. it it's, it's not like we can do it without you. The Lord's saying, look, I've called you with a specific DNA, a breakthrough anointing that you have on your life that the Lord wants here. And I know that you have been mishandled. I know you've seen things that I saw you spit like this because it was tasted bitter in your mouth. You've tasted things in the church. You didn't even want it in your mouth. And the Lord says, that's why I've called you to change it. You're my John the Baptist. He said, you're my John the Baptist. He said, I've called you to help change it. And Amanda, for you, I saw you as a couple of things. I might have even prophesied this over you before. I don't know. But um, I saw you as a wildflower, right? And the Lord said, she's my wildflower. And I was like, why is that significant? You know, because wildflowers grow in the wilderness where nobody expects them. And I just feel like you are a breath of fresh air in the wilderness. Like people that are going through the, the desert place, the dry place, that they're lost and they all of a sudden stumble upon you. And the Lord says, you have a gift in you of empathy, of compassion. And the Lord says, and I saw you bloom just like that. And he goes, this is a year where you bloom, where you come out of your shell because you have valuable gifts in you that people need desperately. You both do. And you've seen him take on so much. And you've seen him get hurt. You've seen him get used. And it's caused you to fight for him. But the Lord's saying this, I want you both to fight. I want you both to fight. He said, I want you to put your roots down and decide to fight. Because it's easy to get hurt and run. 
I've done that my whole life. I wasn't in the church for so long because I was so disheartened by all the garbage that I saw. I'm telling you, and I feel so strongly that the Lord's saying this, I'm telling you as a brother in Christ, I need you both here. My wife needs you here. Pastor Daniel, the whole team, we need you guys here involved because you've got something that we need in the DNA, in your DNA that God's put in you. Don't deprive us of what God's doing in you. And I want to pray for you both because you care enough that you'll do it and you'll fight for it. I know you're a fighter. I see that all over you. You're not going to back down or give up. And that's good because we need a dose of that. So extend your hands. Lord, I thank you for... Gracie, would you come up here, sweetie? Lay hands on her. Thank you. Lord, we just, we just lay hands on this awesome, godly couple. <laughs> you know, I see you sitting in a truck bed. And um, I saw you guys, like, driving down a country road surrounded by fields on the left and on the right. And I saw you guys talking, and you were talking about the church and frustration. And, I, and there was this common theme that came out of your mouth of, they just don't get it. And Lord, I thank you, God, that you said, you know what? You're right. Some of them just don't get it. And he said, but you do, so why are you driving down this country road? Why don't you turn around and help her get it? And so, Lord, we thank you that they're answering the call. Father God, that they're saying yes to the invitation, Father God. That, God, they're saying yes to wearing their heart on their sleeves again. Father God, that they can be brave and be willing to be hurt. God, because Jesus, you are taking the blows. Father, and I thank you that we will guard them. <laughs> we will guard you. I'm telling you this as a brother in the Lord. We will guard you. I will go to war with you. I will fight with you on your behalf. We will stand with you. Something comes up and it spooks you like a wild horse to run off. I'll be there with you. So, Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus for anchors, Father God, restoration of hope, healing, Father God, of wounds that have been delivered from uh, Christians, God, with insensitive hands. Father God, I just pray for healing over this family. And in the name of Jesus, we just surrender any, any roots of bitterness, Father God. Any roots of bitterness, God, we just surrender them, God. And I ask for, the, for this John the Baptist couple to rise up and be a voice in the wilderness, the wilderness of Orange, Texas, declaring the way of the Lord, making crooked paths straight, and making mountains bow down low. Father, we thank you for their calling, their giftings, that they have value. That you aren't, you know, the Lord says this, there's a difference between being used and being all you can be. And Lord, I just thank you that you're taking them into the season of being all they can be. Lord, we thank you for them. In the name of Jesus, bless them, bless their family. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't Jesus good? I think you can do a little better than that. That was a depressing clap. You're not, just to assure everybody, you're not clapping for me. You're clapping for Jesus, okay? Like, so it's okay to clap for Jesus because when we prophesy, it is a testimony of Jesus Christ. So we are speaking out what he thinks about you. Amen? Well, all right. Okay, I thought I was done, but I'm not done yet. You ever get that? I think you're done and you're not done. Justin, your girlfriend? I'm like, it's okay that I said girlfriend, right? <laughs> you're not in that weird friendship stage, so... <laughs> Right? You just never know. And what's your name again? Callie. Callie. Just extend your hands to Callie. Uh, Callie, you're another one that I saw with just an awesome gift of compassion on you. And I just saw you as one who fights for the underdog. And uh, you were so unsatisfied with injustice on people's lives. And I saw children, right? And they had no voice. And you gave them a voice. And I felt like the Lord says, you're an equipper. You're one that raises up children. You're one that raises up warriors. You're like a Deborah. See, Deborah was a prophetess and a judge. And I feel like there's this supernatural hunger on you to understand the supernatural world and the things of God, this curiosity. And um, even the Lord says, uh, I've been speaking to you in your dreams. And I just see your dream life just coming absolutely, totally alive. 
And the Lord says, pay attention to your dreams because I'm going to start speaking to you through pictures in your dreams for a new season of your life. But um, I just want to pray for you that you would step into the fullness of your calling because you have so much heritage in you and you have so much greatness in you. You have a teaching ability, a teaching gift in you to instruct and the Lord put that in you. And um, you're another one with wisdom on your lips, just like Justin. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay. Lord, so we just pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you, God, that she knows what church tastes like. Father God, I thank you that you called her to be, God, um, outside the box in her thinking. Lord, and I also just thank you, Lord, that you called her to be artistic. God, I just saw this artistic gift getting squeezed out of her, Father God. I saw you, typically when I see this, I know what the Lord's saying. I saw you like a tube of paint, right? And like the Lord squeezed you out like an oil-based paint. And um, you, it was this beautiful red color. And just typically when I see that, the Lord's saying he's going to breathe on your artistic abilities. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would breathe on her artistic abilities. The Lord says this too. Your plans for the future are not foolish. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Your plans for the future are not foolish, even if people may not understand. The Lord says, I have prepared a way for you, and it's my plan. So the Lord says, don't worry about defending yourself where you're going. Just let me build your story. So, Lord, we just thank you for that, God. I thank you for the gift of compassion that she has, Father God, that she refuses to let anyone fall. She's a great warrior for you, God, and a fighter for people. Lord, I thank you that she will stand for social justice, Father God. Bless her, God. Bless her family. Let everything she touches, Father, prosper. In the name of Jesus, amen. You're welcome. tell you. Boy, I'll tell you. Boy, I'll tell you. All right, everybody, you can be seated. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This, this is the type of person I am. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to force prophetic words. When it's shut down, it's shut down. When I feel the anointing lift, it lifts. And so um, if you didn't get a word tonight, chill. Okay, just relax. You know, open your Bible and watch what God tells you. It's better to hear from God than me, I'll tell you that right now. If I'm telling you, it's good, but if God's telling you directly, it's even better. Amen? Some people are like, I didn't get a word, I really wanted a word, and God's like, hello? Hello? Are you listening to a word I've said? <sighs> Amen. Uh, we're going to pray, and then we're just going to get into the message tonight. Um, I'm not going to go too long. I know that um, it's a school night, theoretically. But um, the Lord really put something on my heart this afternoon, uh, or this morning during church. You know, when we were calling out shame and people processing shame, shame is one of the number one killer of Christians. We have been delivered from shame through the cross, through Jesus Christ. We've been delivered permanently from the wages of sin and death, permanently. Now, you can choose... To get back into alignment with it. You can put on your old earth suit all you want. That's up to you. But God say, Jesus is saying, hey, I removed all that. I removed all that. So when you sin, now, now listen. Hear me out here tonight because this is not a sloppy grace message, okay? When you sin, there is something called conviction from the Holy Spirit. Conviction in the Greek means this, proof of guilt. It's the Holy Spirit coming to you saying, hey, you're guilty of this. This isn't good. You need to repent so I can restore you and mature you and heal you. But we get it confused with condemnation, which means no longer fit for use. We feel condemned, but there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But yet when we fail, we're down on the ground, and Satan is an opportunist. And he comes to you at your weakest, darkest, most frail moments to take your life from you. That's what he does. If you feel shame, I want to tell you this. If you feel shame, it is not Jesus Christ. If you feel conviction from the Holy Spirit, that's the Lord. And there's a difference. One is a godly sorrow. Conviction from the Holy Spirit is a godly sorrow. You feel mourning and moved in your gut for what you've done because it separates you relationally, not, not out of your salvation, but it separates you relationally from God. It gets in the way. See, God doesn't want us to sin not because of the law. Don't sin because it's bad, and that's what Christians do. They don't sin. That's a stupid reason to not sin. That's why most of us are sinning at 2 in the morning compulsively. Okay. We'll get there tonight. 
God doesn't want you to do something about this sin issue. Sin has already been taken care of on the cross. He alone can atone for your sin. You cannot. And when you constantly remember your sin and your failure, you are trying to atone for your own sin. You have to let the work of the cross restore you and heal you. You cannot let Satan hold your history over you. Listen, it's only in God that we're not known for our history, but we're known for our future. That's how he looks at us. But how many times have you failed, have you sinned, and that's all you think about, and it comes back at night to haunt you, and you lay on your pillow, and you cry about it, and you think about it, and you're at work, and your stomach's in knots, thinking about, what, how could I have done that? That's not God. You know what the key to repentance is? It's not repetition. It's sincerity. It's not, it's not whipping yourself in your bedroom because of what you've done. You think he wants to do that? He already took the lashes for you. The title of this message tonight is called Repetitive Repenting Disorder. It's based off of Hebrews 10. This is what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to pray, and then if I have your permission... I'm going to take your theology out, I'm going to tickle it, and I'm going to kick it out of the room, and we're going to kick it down the street, and you can go chase it and find it if you want it. Does that sound like a fun time? All right. Now look, I prophesied over you, so just hang with me. Lord, we just thank you for this evening. Holy Spirit, we thank you for loving us. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to challenge the areas of our mind and our hearts that are not in alignment with truth. Jesus, we surrender what we know from Christian culture to you. Let the truth penetrate our hearts. Let us surrender Christian culture and let us embrace the truth of Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know what drives me crazy is uh, Christianese language. I don't know if any of you have grown up around Christianese where everybody says like churchy things and you're just like, that's so weird. Like who says that? Like, you know, whenever, whenever somebody gets sick or, they, you know, like they, they find out they have a disease. And I can't tell you, how, growing up in church, I can't tell you how many times somebody got cancer and I heard, well, amen, God's just trying to teach you something. No, he's not. God doesn't need, God will never use infirmity to improve your character. He can use himself. He can use his kindness, his compassion, his goodwill, his mercies that are new every morning. Now, that doesn't mean that we never get sick. That means that in the midst of a trial, God can still manifest his love in that trial, but it doesn't mean that he necessarily brought it to you. Some things we get into are from our own foolish actions. And we're like, well, God's just trying to teach me something. And he's like, yeah, don't do that again. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to teach you. Stop doing that. But we say things in church and we just kind of go, yeah, amen, amen. Like new levels, new devils, brother. That's not in the Bible. I don't know if you know that. But the theology in the Bible is this, new levels, greater angels of visitation. New levels, greater levels of favor. I don't know why we're so Satan-centric in the church. Every good thing that comes, we're like, oh, now the devil's really after you. Shut up. That's his job. We know that. That comes with the deal, right? We don't minimize Satan and be foolish about it. But at the same time, I'm not even looking at that fool. I'm looking at my dad. I'm looking at what God's doing in my life. I'm not like, oh, man, we got new levels of favor. Man, grace, we got new levels of blessing in our ministry. Well, things are going to get really bad for a while. Like, what kind of theology is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's not Christology. That's Western civilization. That's Western Christianity. Not Hebraic, not Greek, not the Aramaic life of Jesus Christ, but that's Western Christianized mentality. It's because we leave just enough room for disappointment that's why. We could say, oh, when good things happen, then something bad happens. And go, well, it's just because you've done great things. Does that sound like something you want to serve? Like, hey, awesome, I'm moving along with God. By the way, my whole family died in a car accident. But you know what? God's doing great things. God didn't bring that to you. It happened. And he can use it. But it happened, and it's not that he brought it to you. See, we would rather say that we don't understand God in this regard, we'd rather say that, well, he knows more than we do, than admit that we don't know everything. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, if, if somebody gets sick and they die, we would rather say, well, God had it for a reason because we don't understand. We, we don't want to admit that God's, God is all-powerful. Understand what I'm saying here. He is all-powerful. But there are times where we don't know what he's doing. We're like, why didn't you interact in this situation? Why didn't you invade? When I was in sixth grade and I had to bury my best friend from cancer, like, wh why, why would that happen? God, God's saying, hey, I'm not powerless. We have to make peace with not understanding everything. But in church culture, we just, we just fall into whatever kind of spills out of our mouth. You know, we've, we've talked about this, like where it says, um, where I am weak, then he is strong, right? We've talked about that. And I said, how many here know that verse where it says, where I am weak, he is strong? And everybody's hands went up in this room. That's not in the Bible. It says, when I am weak, then I am strong. There's certain, like where it says, he, he, uh, Jesus chastises those he loves, right? God chastises those he loves. How many of you have heard that? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. That's in the Bible, okay? I know what's going on. People are like, I don't want to, he's going to call me out. I'm not calling anybody out, <laughs> okay? That's in the Bible. But the word chastise does not mean beat. It does not mean whip. It does not mean scream at. It does not mean punish. It means bring to maturity. God brings to maturity those he loves. Doesn't that change things? We have to be stewards of the word of God, good stewards of the word of God, because we've got to break through Christian garbage, Christian consumerism. Some of you bought into a culture, but never the man. And there's a problem with that, because you're not getting in. Look, I know this is sensitive, and some of us are like, whoa, 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 Luke. We just want the prophecy and the sweet, nice words and make us laugh. I care enough about you to let you know that not everybody's getting in. You don't get into the house just by living on the block. You can go to church, but if you don't know who he is, if you're not interacting with Jesus, it doesn't count. There's people that cast out devils, that prophesied, healed the sick in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said what to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I do not know you. You workers of lawlessness, I do not know you, he said. These are people that are experiencing stuff many of you in this room have not experienced. How many of you in this room have prayed for somebody with stage 4 cancer and it's been lifted off of them? How many of you in this room have prophesied deep things over people? Some of you have. But many of us haven't as, as a whole. And these people had operated in that and Jesus is like, hey, I don't know you. You can't come in. You know what's happened in our culture? We've taken sovereignty, the sovereignty of God, and we've taken that as approval for where we're at with God. And that's a huge mistake because there's power in the name of God. All sovereignty means is a supreme power, which means a witch dying of a drug overdose in an alleyway can call on the name of Jesus with sincerity and he will rescue her. Does that mean that he approves of where she's at? No. But we think that way. We gossip. We lie. We steal. We cheat. We do inappropriate things. And then God shows up in a service and we're square with him. And he's going, no, no, no. I poured out my presence because I'm a good father. But I want you to be deeper in a relationship with me to understand who I am. Reading, the, knowing the Bible doesn't matter if you don't know who it's about. Demons know the word of God. The Pharisees knew the Torah. And they were not friends of God. Jesus actually told them that Satan was their father. That's pretty intense, isn't it? Like, we like to be nice Christians. You know what I'm saying? Like... <laughs> But Jesus is like, oh, of course you don't know who I am because Satan's your father. Could you imagine that conversation with somebody in the lobby? Some of you are like, I'd like to have that conversation with somebody in the lobby. God wants to, the Holy Spirit wants to challenge our theology to separate Christian consumerism from truth of Scripture. There, ha there has to be a defining because there is a difference. One is man-based theology that can break our hearts. Cause us to live in shame until, I mean, Christians are weird, dude. Like, we can sin, and then we're like, we can't pray for anybody for three weeks until it wears off. <laughs> right? No, that's true. There, I meet people all the time that are like, I just, I can't pray for anybody tonight. I just can't pray. And I'm like, why, why can't you pray? I just, well, I swore on the way here. And I'm like, okay, well, did you repent? Are you sorry? Yeah. Okay then let's pray for people. No, I'm just not ready yet. That's showing that you're trying to atone for your own sin and you're not letting Jesus in to atone for it. You're controlling it. 
we serve a forgetful God. He chooses by his own great name to forget what we've done. He says, mm, with my own greatness, I'm going to just erase that. We're going to prove this to you. We, we cannot spend the rest of our days apologizing for our past. We have to be Lazarus Christians, and we have to come forth. We've got to come out and, and peel the grave clothes off. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sick and tired of Christians living at the foot of Calvary. He got off the tree, okay? I don't know if you know that, but he got off the tree. And he got up again. Why don't you? He cared enough about you to get up again. So why don't you care enough about you to get up again? He saw so much value in you that he gave you eternal chances. But we like to put him in a box and say, well, I failed so much. It just takes time. But we come into worship. You know this. How many of you go through this? You come into worship God and, and you can't settle your mind down. You're just thinking about all the bad stuff you did. You're just like, oh, this is all the ways I failed. I was trying to quit smoking. I told my family I'd quit smoking. But you know what? I smoked a pack and a half today. And then like you're, some of you are like, don't talk. Don't, don't prophesy over me. Don't. Just kidding. <laughs> Don't point me out, right? <laughs> my, my point is this, is that you may have issues, and you're saying that somehow it inhibits God's ability to love you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I'm telling you, your goodness or your wickedness will never sway the love of God. It will never decrease or increase. It's always at full strength. It's just a matter of whether or not you tap into it and walk into it relationally. It's always there. He never ebbs and flows with his love. It's always there, always on full blast. Imagine a fire hydrant shooting out water full blast. That's the love of God all the time. You're just not in front of it. If you're feeling fear, you're not feeling love. Well, I love you. But I'm tired of coming into worship, and I used to be like this, thinking all the time about all the ways I failed. I'd just be in there for the first 20 minutes working through all the garbage that I dealt with all week. All the ways I failed. And then finally lock eyes with Jesus with the last 10 minutes of worship and be like, oh, there you are. And I'm tired of shame-based Christianity because it makes us freaks. Shame-based Christianity causes you to be critical of yourself and then become critical of everyone else around you. That's how the religious spirit manifests itself. Through a, through a critical spirit. You get hard on yourself and you expect that same thing from everybody else. See, people that are religious are in deep, deep pain. Deep pain. But there's got to be some point where we get out of repetitive repenting. Where you just push delete on the ways you've made mistakes and you go on. Why, I mean, why lug around a dead, stinking, rotting corpse with you everywhere you go? That's your failure. It's like carrying around a big bag of cow crap. We're pretty rural out here. I can say cow crap, right? It's like walking around with that on your back, and God's like, hey, gross. And we're like, no, this is mine. I have to carry it with me everywhere I go. I have to warn everybody about who I am and what I've done. You know, there's a difference between sharing a testimony and warning everybody about what you've done. I meet people that are like, oh, I failed this way, and I just want you to know that I did that. And I'm like, why would you tell me that? Didn't God forgive you? And they're like, well, yeah, but I just thought you should know if you're going to be my friend. And I'm like, why? I'm not friends with that person. I'm friends with who Christ created. We've got to come out of shame-based Christianity. And it's, it's poisoned our hearts, and it's broken our lives. We even read the Bible through shame-based filters. I was reading the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. How many of you know that story? Right? Jesus is walking around. Zacchaeus was a wee little tax collector. He's an Irish Jew climbing a tree. And he was like, oh, I want to see Jesus. I want to see my Savior. And Jesus was like, yo, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm giving the message version. <laughs> He's like, yo, get out that tree. I want to talk to you. What's funny is he calls him by his name, first of all. He's like, hey, Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. Jesus didn't know him, but Jesus was more than just a prophet. And Jesus is like, hey, get out of that tree. And shows him kindness, invites himself over to dinner at Zacchaeus' house. And I was sitting there reading with the worship music on, thinking I was being super spiritual because I had the latest version of the Bethel album, right? And I was like, okay, now I'm being super spiritual. And I'm, mm, Holy Spirit, speak to me. 
And the Lord goes, would you knock it off? Because I was like, Lord, how am I like Zacchaeus that you called me out of a tree and you found me lowly and I needed your help? And he's like, Luke, knock it off. And I was like, well, that's kind of rough. You know the Holy Spirit speaks to you in a way you understand. I don't know if you know that. He uses the geography of your life. He doesn't speak in King James. Okay? Just saying. If you grew up watching Sanford and Son, he might sound like Red Fox to you. I don't know. <laughs> Quit doing it, you big dummy. <laughs> what I'm saying is he uses the context of your life. And he knows what it takes to get through to you. So for me, it was knock it off. And I was like, what am I doing? And he goes, when are you going to stop looking for your identity in the sinner in the story and start looking for your identity in how Christ responded to a sinner? He goes, if all you do is relate to the, to the sinner in the story, you'll never become Jesus to the sinner. Because you'll always, and then once you get people saved, you're going to bring them in here and you're going to yoke weird stuff on them. You're going to be like, hey, if you want to be a good Christian, you're not going to own a TV set. Like, if you're going to be a good Christian, you're not going to watch that show. Now, don't get me wrong. There is fruit of righteousness. And the Holy Spirit brings the conviction of that. Not you. You can't bring conviction. This is what I love. <laughs> Some of you are like, I want to argue with him right now. Just hold on. <laughs> I like to mess with you. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> you can't convict people like the Holy Spirit can. If you do, you'll break their spirit and they'll take off. But we are called to work with one another in this regard of teaching, equipping, calling people to a higher level of morality. Some of you are like, I don't want to be told what to do. Well, grow up, take your diaper off, and become a big boy or a big girl. Because that's the reality of the Christian life. We have to be able to confront things and, talk, and to be like, hey, guess what? Don't sleep with your next door neighbor because that's not godly. Like, we have to be able to call people out on things. Hello? I know a lot of people that got this <laughs> tattoo across their chest that says, only God can judge me. That's not in the Bible. Not in reality. There's more than just only God can judge. How many of you love that verse where it says, remove the log from your own eye before, and then it says, and then go and remove the speck from your brother's eye. So we're actually commanded to remove the speck from the other person's eye. But only after we've pulled out our own giant issue. We have to care enough about each other to address things. Amen. So again, I'm not talking about lazy, sloppy Christianity where nothing matters and Jesus is a lazy dad because that's not who he is. Amen? Hebrews 10, 2. Is, I'm speaking out of Hebrews 10 tonight. Now, the picture of Hebrews 10 is this. Levitical priests would offer a sin sacrifice every single year. Every year, you would bring a sacrifice to the Levitical priests they would stand before the altar and they would burn up your sacrifice. And it was a reminder every year of your sin. And that there was no uh, covering of your sin. Or it was only covered for another year. It was never atoned for. It was just covered for another year. So you bought a year of sinning. And so you would go with your offering and it was a reminder. Oh, all, you'd be watching it burn on the altar thinking about all the sins you committed all year long. Watching it burn up. And a Levitical priest would stand, and they don't just stand because they want to stand. Everything a Levitical priest does has a reason behind it. They stand when they offer the sin offering because sin was never atoned for at that point, so their work was never done. So standing was symbolic of our work is never done. And then Jesus came. Allowed small creatures to pin him to a tree died, rose up again, ascended to the right hand of the Father. And what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Because he is our high priest. And see, when a Levitical priest sits down, they're saying, it is finished. It's atoned for. It's, it's done. It's over. It's no longer remembered. But we like to go grave digging. We like to run around and dig up our past and dig up our stuff, dig up other people's stuff. There's some serious witchcraft that goes on in the church. Some serious witchcraft. What would happen if we stopped relating to people out of who they were? Wouldn't you like that? My wife and I, have, we're going on seven years of marriage. And you learn in marriage that you don't have the gift of God to forget all the time. That there's some things 
that are like, you're carrying on and you're like, well, you did that. And it's like, I did that three years ago. And they're like, yeah, well, you still stink and I don't like you <laughs> because of it. <laughs> like there's still issues that we never truly forget. And so it's hard for us to understand that God chooses to forget. That he doesn't relate to you out of your history. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Jesus took care of the sin issue on the cross. And to stop believing in the power of sin in your life is to choose Christ. Now, we will fail. That's not a word curse. That's reality. You're a human being. You're going to fail. You're going to mess up. And one of your greatest theologies about what you believe about God comes out right after you fail. It tells what you really think. If he's an overbearing father, if he's an angry boss, if he's a lazy dad, whatever you believe about God comes out right after you fail. It's really where people's theology is revealed. God is not intimidated by your failure. Look, he's, Jesus paid the price for sin. He's no longer intimidated by your issues. The darkness in you is not so great that he's intimidated. We got to get past the power of sin. It's nothing. It is a smoke and a vapor. It is a cloud. It's not even real. You blow it away. It's that easy. We dip into I know it seems strong. I can feel this right now in the room. I know it feels strong to you. But listen, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you into a place of victory tonight. I want you to grab a hold of this. Some of you want to hang on to your shame. I can't help you. And neither can Jesus. Because he won't violate your free will. You have to choose to let him dismantle this shame-based Christianity. Because it's killing us. It's disqualifying us. Do you know how many young people I meet across this planet that are like, I can't do what God's called me to do because of X, Y, and Z. They feel disqualified. But each and every one of you are absolutely qualified because of what Christ did for you. So what you failed? What if you stopped being so afraid of failing? What if you were just like, you know what, I'm going to mess up. When it happens, I'm going to get up quick. What if that was your mentality? What if, we actually, what if we actually embrace Galatians 5 and we stop backbiting and consuming one another? What if we actually believed in one another? And we said, no matter how much you fail, this is hard for us to grasp, no matter how much you fail, we're going to love you and not give up on you. That's Jesus, by the way. That's how Jesus is. This is not sloppy grace. Love demands a response. Okay, which means when you're loved, love-motivated obedience, not religious obligation. Doing the right thing because you're loved, not because you're told to. You think as a dad that I want my daughter to obey the law because it's the law? No way. I want her to obey the, I want her to obey the law because she's motivated by love to do the right thing. I tell people, I've, I've had this conversation several times. People are like, well, you know, as a man of God, what do you believe about the law? Look, I don't believe... <sighs> How do I say this without causing like a huge thing here? <laughs> um, I believe in the law of morality. I obey the law of the land. But I am not held mor morally to the standard of the law of the land. I'm held morally to the word of God. That's my compass. God wants to break shame off of our lives, uh, legalistic things off of our lives. When you try to become reconciled to the law, it only leads to death. That's it. There's no reward in it. Doing the right thing just because you're a Christian doesn't count. It doesn't count at all. And some of you have been white-knuckling it. And you're like, I've just I got to do the right thing. And God's like, okay, how about you choose out of love to do the right thing instead of just, well, look, this is, I read it on the AG website. I read it on the Foursquare website. I read it on this website. This is what we don't do. We don't dance. We don't do this. We don't, look, what if you didn't read all that? Hello? What if love was your anchor? What if you believed you were loved and that your sin didn't disqualify you? Because there is no sin now. There is only repentance and restoration. Um, now, get, understand, we can step back into that. That's up to you. But for a healthy relationship in Christ Jesus, sin is dead. It's dead in your life. 
You know why we sin? This is an interesting thing here. Because we have unresolved wounds. That's why we sin. And of course it's fun. I mean, let's, let's be honest. It feels really awesome to sin for a little bit. And then once that sort of honeymoon phase wears off, you're like, ah, uh, this is awful. If sin wasn't fun, we wouldn't struggle with that. <laughs> People get really weirded out when you talk about sin and when you talk about this stuff. Look, this is, this is Theology 101, okay? This is, th these are the things we have to establish as a Christian culture, amen, to talk about, to talk over. Just like Pastor this morning was talking about sex. You can feel everybody in the room blush, but it's needed. People are like, I don't want to, I just want to be a Ken and Barbie doll. Can't we just do that? <laughs> How are babies made? Look, people high five and that's it, okay? Good luck with life, okay? We wonder why sometimes we churn out socially retarded Christian kids. It's because we don't talk about anything real with them. We don't address real issues. I'm telling you, we've got to talk about this stuff. We have to talk about this stuff. For the sake of the future of the church, not that it's up to us, but we, are, Jesus Christ is literally riding on top of us like a horse into the lost. We're a catalyst. We're the train that Jesus gets on. And he's like, let's go. And so we, I want to bring people into, like people in Orange, Texas and around the region that come to this church. I don't want them getting yoked with weird stuff that breaks their hearts. I don't want them getting yoked with performance-based Christianity that says, look, I don't, you know, my wife and I, we have a friend, right, getting married, super excited, wanted to slow dance with her dad, right, daddy-daughter dance at the wedding. But the, the groom's parents were like, well, we don't, in our faith, we don't believe in dancing, so if you dance, we're not coming to your wedding. Like, how demonic is that? That's demonic. It's not like they're on the dance floor doing, you know, the booty shake, Right? <laughs> That's not what they're doing. It's a father and a daughter dancing as he's giving her away to her husband. You know, but this is what religion does. It breaks your heart and it tears your family apart. That, and I'm not satisfied with that. And I will not let anything I'm involved with be yoked with that garbage. That's part of the reason I'm here. Not that you've been under a yoke of religion, but we want to push into something way deeper we want to push into something way deeper than just social Christians that show up on a Sunday. This couple who, who were boycotting their son's wedding, do you know what their favorite TV show is? Dancing with the Stars. Hello? How stupid is that? Like, we're not going to your wedding. We don't believe in dancing. Dancing with the Stars is on. It's a marathon. Like, one of the most scantily clad dancing shows on TV. Right? And they're like, we love that show. By the way, if you dance, we're not going. That's what religion does. It's a double standard. It's the same people I know. Look, we're going to get into it now. Now, now I'm riled up. Now we're going to get into it. Listen, I was talking to a pastor, and I'm going to push the envelope. We'll see if I still am at work on Monday. <laughs> Look, this is a question I was asked. <laughs> I'm feeling it right now. Somebody asked me, can a homosexual be filled with the Holy Spirit? You know what I said? I said, yes. And it made this pastor very angry. He said, how, how can you say that? How can somebody be filled with the Holy Spirit when they're given into that kind of a lifestyle? And I knew this pastor, and I said, well, you've been addicted to porn for three years, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. How else do you expect anyone to mature and change and grow in any way, shape, or form if they're not filled with the Holy Spirit? That's how people are transformed, not by what you want, not by what we believe, but what the Word of God says. Now, don't quote me a bunch of garbage on Facebook or email me either. All I'm saying, the only statement I'm saying right now is everyone on this planet needs the Holy Spirit. But we've got all these precursors for what's the worst of the worst. I used to smoke pot and drink till I blacked out and ate 200 Vicodin a week. And if somebody took the Lord's name in vain, I was ready to fist fight them. Right? Like, how stupid is that? You know what I'm saying? Like, 
I, I'm passed out for days, waking up and like, oh, where am I? You know. And then somebody's like, oh, GD. And I'm like, I will fight you if you take the Lord's name in vain. And I'm like, don't you know that he loves you? And they're like, you've been passed out for three days at a party. Like, I don't know why you're saying that. That's what religion does. It's a double standard. You know what the problem is? We, we love grace for ourselves, but we don't like it for anybody else. That's, that's really part of the reality of it, is that we're like, look, there's plenty of grace that I have for myself. I know the measure of my heart. I know that when I say something I shouldn't, that God has forgiveness for me. Amen. And we can start over again. And then we see somebody outside, you know, that's like talking on their phone and they swear. And we're like, I thought they were a man of God. They swore on their phone. And it's like, the Lord's like, seriously? You swear all night at your house. Like, and you heard them swear outside the church and that's, that's, what, that's what's getting you? Hello? I think I just hit a nerve. I think I might have just hit a nerve right there. It's super weird that we have all these exceptions for ourselves, but we don't extend that same grace to other people. And this is why. Because grace makes us special. And if I'm special and you're special, then nobody's special. You can't have grace because I have grace. We have to extend it equally to everybody. It's like, it's like a government program. It's for everybody. <laughs> Just sign the papers. It's for everybody. Grace is for everybody. But those of us in the room that hold things, oh, we're, we're like in hostage negotiations with Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. Have you ever done that? Like, I still do it to this day. I'm going to be totally transparent, <laughs> right? Like when I fail, then like later on, like I'll get like a stomach ache or something. I'm like, oh, God, forgive me if I did something wrong. And if you ever do that, like you're like, if you just make me feel better, I'll never do that again, right? <laughs> if you just help me in this situation, I'll never do that again. What's hilarious to me about that is like as if Jesus is looking at us going, oh, oh, really? Oh, you'll never do it? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, then I'll help you out. Like it doesn't matter what we say. He's going to help us out. If we ask with sincerity and say, Father, help us, he's like, sweet, let me come help you. But we get in this weird hostage negotiations where we're like, oh, I remember when I got diabetes, I was like, Jesus, I don't know what I did. If it's because of all the years of drug addiction and everything that I did to bring this on myself, I'm so sorry, and please just heal me. And he's like, uh, that's not because of what you did in the past. It happened to you because you were 90 pounds heavier and you ate like a billion carbs with every meal and you never exercised and there's, you live in a fallen world and yes, I can heal you and I will heal you one day. Okay, that removes a lot of the shame from it. Now I have ownership. Wouldn't that be something if instead of shame we had ownership? Ownership causes you to change. Shame gives you a reason to never change. That was the Holy Spirit right there. I don't know if you caught that. Shame gives you a reason and a license to stay hidden. Ownership does not. Start owning what we've done and bearing it. Maybe we need to just symbolically have a Sunday morning where we have a funeral service. Just get a casket up here and we'll be like, look, just all your junk. If it's on the internet, put it on a DVD and we'll throw it in here. You know, like just, I promise we won't watch it. We'll just burn, we'll just bury it. We need to, and listen, the reason, <laughs> I'm closing with this. <laughs> the reason we have to understand coming out of shame-based Christianity is the next revival that hits the earth, the people that are leading it are people you would not feel comfortable with unless you get past this stuff. We're, we're, working, we're working with a movement. It's called the Unfail Movement. There's a website, unfailmovement.org, uh, where we're getting different people that have miserably failed dramatically, terribly, and God restored them. That's really the plan. Nobody is ever disposable in the kingdom of God. We're all supposed to be restored. That's how this works. It's not, oh, you're out, oh, you're out, you messed up, oh, you're out. That's not, that's, that's demonic, that's not God. Everyone's supposed to be restored. There's a young lady that uh, we are in contact with. She was a porn star. And she got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and came out of the porn industry and is now like, she was on The View and on these different shows talking about what God's done in her life. But how do we react when she shows up on a Sunday morning after she's had augmentation surgery that she didn't get removed? Hello? How do we react when people come in that don't fit our little churchy mold? 
when they lay hands on somebody with stage 4 cancer, they get healed and you don't get offended because God didn't choose you to do it. There's revival coming and it is of the underdog. It is of the unchurched and the unloved. It is of the lost and the hopeless, the transgenders, homosexuals, drug addicts, prostitutes, meth lab owners. <laughs> Some of you don't like that. What if God saved somebody that owned a meth lab? What would that do for this area? I was in Arkansas preaching at a meeting. And there was these two guys in line that came forward. This young man and this old man. And they were, um, we were worshiping. God was moving. And this young man gave his life to the Lord right there at the altar. Isn't that awesome? And I was like, this is awesome. The whole room jumps up and goes, yeah! Like just started yelling and cheering. And I was like, that's really like an aggressive reaction. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> normally people get saved are like, that's good. That's good. That's nice. That's we golf clap it out when somebody gets saved typically. And these people are like, yeah, like freaking out. I was like, whoa. And then this guy, this older guy, falls down to his knees and just starts blubbering like a baby. I'm like, what's this is the weirdest church I've ever been at. Like, what's going on? So the service gets done and the pastor comes up and he goes, I have never seen that in the 30 years of being a pastor. And I said, What? You've never had anybody saved in 30 years? That's really sad. <laughs> and he's like, no, Luke, he's the number one meth dealer in Arkansas, in the whole state of Arkansas. And he got saved at that altar, turned his life around, right? Gracie and I still keep in contact with them on social media. And you see them in church on a Sunday morning, raising their hands, worshiping God, right? This is what's crazy. That older man that fell to the ground and started crying, he came up, and I was like, dude, why did you cry so hard? And he goes, uh, you don't understand. I'm the county sheriff. I've been pursuing him for five years, and I just watched him get saved in the same meeting as me. Now, doesn't that throw a bee in your bonnet? What do you do with that? That's what revival looks like, but revival can only come in on the wings of grace where there's no shame. We've got to, as a community, decide to say, look, no shame. If you're screwing around, if you're messing up, if you're doing things in darkness, just come out. Let's talk about it. What if we promise, like, okay, you, you're addicted to porn? Like, let's talk it out. Let's pray for you. You're a gossip. You're practicing witchcraft. You're, you're passed out drunk all the time. You're a drug addict. Let's talk about it. Let's get it healed and dealt with instead of giving it its strength in, in a hidden place. I want revival in this church. It's one, of the th it's one of the things that God spoke to my wife and I about coming here to Orange. When we prayed, God said, I want to bring revival to community church in Orange, Texas. These are not just feel-good messages. These are, we are preparing you to be a container for revival. I'm telling you, where this church is going, you, don't, you will not even recognize it. Some of you, that's scary, and that's okay. It will be good, and it will be God. Let me just say this real quick, too, and then I want to just close. I want to, I want to pray for you guys, too, tonight. If you're dealing with shame-based Christianity, if there's just things from your past that you're just having trouble letting go of, it's okay. We're going to open up these altars, and we're, come down, and we're going to lay hands on you. And we're going to pray for you to finally get to bury this issue. And it's, it's okay. It's boldness that confronts that spirit. So I'm going to ask you in a little bit to be brave and come up. If you got a hang-up, if you got an issue, and you're like, look, I just haven't forgiven myself for this, come forward. I want to kill some giants at this altar. I forgot what else I was going to say because I was so excited about praying for people. So we're going to pray for people. <laughs> we'll just take that as a cue from the Holy Spirit. I want everybody just close your eyes. Lift your hands to the Lord right where you're at. God, we know that you want to bring revival to this church, to this area, to this region. God, we know that that's your heart's desire. And before you do anything, God, like that, you make the people ready. So, Lord, we thank you for this refining process. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I just, he just brought back to me to my remembrance what I was going to say. 
this is for everybody in the room. I want you to look up here for just a second, and then I'm going to call you forward. Anybody that wants to come forward and just get laid hands on. If I could have some of the uh, staff, some, um, you know, community church people just come up here and just line up to lay hands on people. This is not the Luke show. And so uh, they're just as anointed as I am. Amen. Probably more. <laughs> There's no such thing as a youth movement. I want you to hear me out when I say this. There is no such thing as a youth movement. There's a church movement. There are times in history that the youth have been thrust to the forefront of a movement of God. But it's not a youth-only movement. So I'm speaking to the older generation and the younger generation in this room. We need one another. Period. Older generation, you're not retired. We need you. We need what you have. We need the solidarity you have. We need the ethics you have. We need the morality you have. Because when we've got latchkey kids, they teach themselves what's appropriate. We need mothers and fathers. And mothers and fathers in the room, you need the younger generation too. Because of their zeal. Because of the things they see in their fervency for God. Because they'll see things you don't just like you'll see things they don't. It is a church-wide movement. We don't use divorcing language in this house. We don't say it's only a youth movement. We say it's a community movement. Amen? All right, close your eyes. If you're in this room and you're saying, you know what, Luke? It's true. I've been dealing with a lot of issues that I haven't buried. I just haven't let them go. And I want to let them go tonight. Just come forward. We're going to lay hands on you. If that's you, just come forward. We're just going to press delete and we're going to just move forward. You can choose to go home tonight and sleep with this issue or break up with it right now. Trust me, you don't want shame staring you in the face in the morning. This is what we're going to do. We're going to have the worship team take us in. Because that's how God burns up all the fat. On the altar of worship. And so we're going to just let them burn up our issues. We're just going to lay hands on you. Anybody that's coming forward that's saying, hey, I'm done with it. I, I want to be done with it. And we're just going to lay hands on you and pray for you. And some of it's starting right now. But worship team, if you want to take us back in.